Um, to, this is Privacy Week. It's the start of Privacy Week. It's an exciting week for privacy professionals. Um, the theme is principles to practice. And there's a lot of principles you know, in the air at the moment. We're hearing a lot about new principles and reform of principles. Uh, and I think it's really great to start the week hearing what John has to say about which principles are important and which aren't. Um, I don't think John needs too much introduction. Um, I reckon the only important things to know are he likes bushwalking, live music, and he knows more about privacy than we do. That's probably it in a nutshell. Um, seriously though, first question, maybe it's the um, slightly the elephant in the room. A little bird called Twitter told me that uh, you deleted your Facebook page. I did. Why? Uh, well, um, it wasn't so much of a grand gesture as has been uh, perhaps represented as more of a, um, a thing that's been kind of bugging me for a little while. Uh, I um, opened up a Facebook account um, about 10 years ago and um, I don't know how many changes of terms and conditions we've been through in that time. Um, so really it was just a, it was kind of hitting more, more of hitting a reset button. You know, There's this enormous aggregation of my data which um, in light of recent events I decided I didn't want to entrust the organisation with, even though, to be honest, um, I would never post anything on a social media platform that I wasn't entirely comfortable would be um, broadcast to the world. That's always been my kind of guiding uh, principle. It was also used for flagrant self-promotion as well, so there's nothing hugely private there. But no, I thought that um, going through that process and showing that it can be done would be an important um, kind of leadership thing in a sense uh, for people who have any concerns um, and want to know how you can safely do that, whether you should. So I've deleted mine. Uh, I downloaded all my data first um, so that I can see that it's there, that I, I can now go back and I can friend people who I used to friend. I can not friend people that I used to have. Um, uh, I can decide what um, questionnaires or quizzes I fill in. You know, I remember way back in the day, this thing would pop up saying, have you read this novel? And you go, oh yeah, I have, I really enjoyed that. And you click, and then suddenly you're clicking through every bit of literature you've read in the last 20 years. And um, those purposes were never particularly declared or disclosed. And I think what we found with the My Digital Life application was this kind of misrepresentation and subterfuge, which I think if you believed uh, that um, that was the only instance of a misuse of data, of a misrepresentation of purpose facilitated through that platform, then, um, I don't know, I just, I guess, good luck with Farmville. Apart from highlighting the need for mandatory data breach notification, what else do you think the Facebook breach highlights for us from a privacy perspective, some core kind of issues or concepts that it raises? Well, I, I think one of the really important ones is the internationalization uh, of um, uh, the digital economy um, and the need to have a regulatory regime which recognizes that. Uh, I mean, I, for, to me, it's, um, it, it was a simple matter to say that this organization, which holds the personal information of two and a half million New Zealanders, which offers advertising to local businesses, which, you know, if I get off a plane in Christchurch, will say, hey, do you want to know where your friends went in this new place? Do you not want to know where they went? You know, this, this is an entity that is operating in New Zealand that is therefore subject to New Zealand law. Um, enforcing that is a slightly more complicated matter, as we've found. Uh, and so I think that we need to have uh, um, commensurate uh, kind of enforcement as some of our comparative jurisdictions have to ensure that um, you know we are not just treated as a kind of uh, a, a marginal um, uh, backwater to a I don't know what is it two and a half billion individual um, uh, beast. So yeah, I, I mean there's a lot of things here. The other lesson to learn, I think, is that. Um, you know, the old adage has become so 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 true. It's a, it, well, I'd say old adage. It sounds like it was around when I was a boy. But, you know, we are all now fully conscious and aware of the, the saying that if you are getting something for free, then you are the product. If you're getting an online service for free, you are the product. So anytime you get an app that says 
it's free, then you are contributing something to them. You are adding the value rather than them adding value to your life. Um, mm. there's, there's a few topics I think people really want to hear about today and we'll get to those, but perhaps that's a good segue into the recent um, public survey that your office has procured mm. and some of the interesting outcomes there. Can you talk a bit about what you found most interesting about that survey? Well, uh, we continue to see an, a, a rising uh, level of um, awareness of, I was going to say anxiety, but I don't know if anxiety is quite the right word, that people are more concerned of um, privacy in their lives. They're more concerned that uh, organizations manage their personal data properly. And I, you know, it's hard, our survey just asks about their reckons. It doesn't sort of dig deeper and, and find out why. But I think we've seen so much coverage of the failures in this area that it's got to affect people's level of confidence. Um, so that was one thing. Uh, I was quite interested, actually, um, uh, also the other trend, of course, um, people are concerned about what kids, young people are doing online and uh, whether um, there's adequate protections for them. Um, but drones, that was interesting to me, uh, that um, people are really creeped out by these devices that um, are released into the wild and hover around their apartment window. You know, it's really difficult for people uh, operating those devices to comply with their obligations. How do you give notice of who will hold this data when you've got an aerodynamic device hovering 12 floors above, um, you know, maybe it's inspecting a guttering, maybe it's peeping in your bathroom window. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting example, I think, of, um, of the, the struggle that law has to, and law and social kind of mores have to keep up with the, the, the really rapid pace of uh, technology and the rush to market. I mean, obviously, there's those kind of really glist, you know, the tinselly things that privacy is always associated with, like drones or like Facebook. Did the survey reveal any kind of more nuanced uh, maturing of the public's attitude to privacy? I was really pleased to see that um, awareness of our office has increased and improved, um, and that's a, uh, one of the one of two questions that we and all our APA um, uh, group, in, and you'll know, Devon, APA is. Asia Pacific Privacy Authorities, which is 18 or 20 um, similar uh, jurisdictions, we come together and we meet. We've decided that we should um, uh, ask some common survey questions. Uh, and I think um, in New Zealand, there's a really good level of awareness of privacy issues generally uh, compared to our uh, comparator jurisdictions uh, and a really good awareness of our office. So we're pleased about that. What was the other part of your question? Oh, yeah, that, that's kind of it. It was this idea that are we seeing that the public in New Zealand is more nuanced in its understanding? Yeah, you said about other, other trends. Look, um, government still has a job to do to um, maintain trust. Uh, you know, there is still a, a, a growing level of concern about government's ability to protect our personal information. Now, that's going to affect uh, how we embrace... Uh, new technologies to make public services easier. Mm. Um, you know, I was talking to someone this morning about um, online voting. Uh, surely it's only a matter of time. There's some really significant issues about um, how we facilitate that, how we protect, how we maintain the integrity of our electoral system uh, through these kind of flawed channels and uh, how we get a level of authentication that we can be happy with at the same time without over engineering things you know um, we've you know we've got to recognize that these technologies can increase efficiency hugely they can increase um, uh, our lives improve our lives immeasurably I mean I love my uh, smartphone I stare at it more often than I look at my children um, and um, that's um, you know that's the world that we live in. So we, we you know we're not going to we're not going to hold back the tide of this stuff. We couldn't if we wanted to. We can't build a wall around the the border like they can in some places. Um, but um, you know we do have I think an obligation to ensure that people who are using this technology have due diligence at the outset. That's really important, which as you know is part of the GDPR, uh, and are not playing fast and loose with our personal question or with our trust. And more and more I think we're seeing organisations realising the risks to their own value, that they will burn their shareholder value, they will burn the trust relationship between government if they don't get this stuff right. Uh, That's a good segue I think into the privacy bill and a lot of my clients have said 
why do we need this? We've had a flexible privacy act for so long, 25 years in fact, that's done the job, that's trusted agencies to do the right thing within those flexible boundaries, those principles. Um, and some people think it's, not, it's unfair that they're getting penalized for the bad actions of some major players, the likes of Facebook. Uh, and why should we all be, be sort of brought into this very prescriptive regime? Can you talk us through a little bit about the background of the privacy bill? Where did it come from and why do we need it? Sure. There's quite a lot to unpack from that because actually the fundamentals are going to remain. There's nothing more prescriptive um, about the privacy bill that's in the House at the moment than the, the one that we are working with every day. Um, secondly, what, well, what we do see is increased, you know, some minor increases to the enforcement regime. You know, when I first came in, um, people, I'm sorry if I've repeated this joke, but um, people, some journalists said, oh yeah, he's a privacy watch, he's the watchdog, but he's a toothless watchdog. And my response was, yeah, I may be toothless, but I can exert a bit of pressure with my gums. Um, I've described the enhancements to the enforcement mechanism in the privacy bill as a reasonably serviceable set of dentures. Uh, you know, so we've still got a way to go before we've got you know, the tearing and chewing functions uh, of the privacy regulator. Yeah. Where does it come from? It comes from um, initially uh, 1998 report from the first privacy commissioner, the late Sir Bruce Slane, uh, who um, was obliged by statute to review the operation of the Act after five years, and he and uh, Assistant Commissioner Blair Stewart um, produced a comprehensive review, uh, it was called Necessary and Desirable, which was promptly and almost entirely ignored um, by the uh, government of the day. Um, it wasn't until 2006 or so that um, government grappled with the problem of privacy law reform and decided to um, decisively kick it for touch. Uh, by asking the Law Commission to report. The Law Commission um, did a really thorough and comprehensive review of the Privacy Act, did a full arc from scepticism, I think, to um, an endorsement of the existing approach, and in 2011 produced a report um, uh, recommending modernisation of the, of the law uh, and some enhancements, some tweaks. There's only about four or five new policy initiatives um, but they said it should also be uh, modernised, we should incorporate the necessary and desirable tweaks. Uh, so in 2014, um, then Minister of Justice took a paper to her Cabinet colleagues, uh, sort of cherry-picking a bit from the Law Commission report. Uh, Cabinet endorsed the drafting of a new privacy bill. A new Minister of Justice came along, slammed the brakes on, uh, and um, the new government that's just... Um, started last year uh, has decided to prioritise privacy and we're really grateful for that. So the Minister of Justice said we know it's based on the previous government's work, we know it doesn't take into account anything since um, 2011 but let's just get it in the House and we'll see what we can do. So this is my plea to you all uh, to have a look at it, to make submissions to um, the Select Committee uh, which will receive your submissions until the 24th of May. We've still got a couple of weeks uh, what I've taken to saying, just before I move on, is that um, the bill as it is reflects those 2011 uh, recommendations of the Law Commission as defined or accepted by government in 2014. So if this law proceeds in its current state through the Parliament and out the other end, we will, by this time next year, have a Privacy Act fit for 2013. So I need your help to tell Parliament whether that's good enough for you, whether you, whether you see uh, a commensurate level of protection for your personal information that you would expect uh, given what's happening in other jurisdictions. So John, what does that mean for you in practice then? A Privacy Act fit for 2013, what's it missing? Well, uh, it's missing a number of things. You know, we haven't even started the conversation in New Zealand about the right to be forgotten, which um, citizens in Europe enjoy uh, a right to say, well, actually, I have a slightly unusual name. This thing happened to me, or this humiliation, or this thing that I couldn't control uh, eight, 10, 12 years ago. Um, but it's the first thing that pops up when you Google my name, right? So we, we have- Your name specifically? 
Uh, my name is, is not bad, actually. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of noise out there on the John Edwards stakes. Uh, for a long time, when you Google John Edwards, the top hit on Google was a story in the New York Times which said, is John Edwards the most reviled man in America? Um, so I get a bit of protection from my scurrilous namesakes. But no, uh, there are many. And, and of course, there are, there are going to be difficult choices when we start to have that conversation. But uh, I, I, don't, you know, I don't think we can avoid that discussion for much longer. There is in the GDPR a uh, right to object to automated processing. There is a need for algorithmic transparency. More and more, your rights to access a particular service or the basis on which you're offered a particular product is determined by data, statistics, data points that you may not even know you've contributed to these organizations. Assumptions about you from uh, where you live, from where you went, from what somebody else purchased while they were using your account, a whole range of things. Um, and I think it's really important for some light to be shone on some of those things. So I'm, I'm quite keen on exploring this idea of um, uh, algorithmic transparency. Yeah. What else? There's well, actually, I just wanted to challenge you on something. Uh, when we talk about the privacy bill and the positives and the negatives of it, we, we constantly compare this to the GDPR. Why is it that the EU standard that they've come to is the best internationally? Why are we relying on them to be the arbiter of what best privacy practice is? Uh, well, I'm not sure that... I'm not sure that I'm saying that we are. I guess um, uh, the, the, our privacy law uh, and the European approach both have a common provenance. They both owe their origins to the 1980 OECD principles. Now, uh, they've worked well, uh, translated into the New Zealand environment. Uh, I don't think anybody has uh, recommended a fundamental revisiting of that approach. Um, what we have in New Zealand that is, I think, different from Europe is the harm-based enforcement. So rather than being a prescriptive level of uh, obligation that is enforced uh, without reference to value for individuals, you know, somebody has to come up and say, this thing happened to me, this agency did something, uh, it didn't comply with the principles and it caused me some harm. I think what we see in, in Europe uh, as they gear up to the GDPR is a lot of unnecessarily, uh, is a lot of activity, but I think it doesn't all lead to positive outcomes for individuals. Um, and that's where my focus is. Let's not lose sight of, you know, it shouldn't be a compliance exercise. We should maintain the human individual uh, at every point. There should be consequences if you do something um, that uh, causes someone harm. Is it fair, do you think, to rely on the individual to raise a bad practice in a big corporation or a government department they've got no choice but to deal with? Well, I, I think one of the uh, weaknesses that you're pointing out there is that they may not know about it. You know, mm -hmm. that so much of what happens with our data is invisible. And I think the mandatory data breach notification uh, is going to be a really important um, part of that. Now that, yes, is going to get us to the level of the GDPR, but you know, it also only catches us up with Australia. It only catches us up with Japan and Korea. You know, 48 of 50 states in the US have mandatory data breach, so we've fallen way behind there, and that, you know, that's been recognised as an important uh, value to allow individuals to avoid the harm yeah. uh, occasioned by things over which they've had no control. One area that the mandatory breach notification doesn't necessarily capture is the systemic bad practice, the ongoing gentle creep of bad privacy practice. Um, there are some other changes in the privacy bill contemplated that might assist you, for example, increased auditing powers and enforcement powers. How would you comment on those as being a more positive side to the changes? Well, there's, the, there's no auditing uh, obligation in the new bill. Uh, that was something that the Law Commission recommended, that we supported, that the government in 2014 didn't uh, uh, proceed with. Um, we've come back, in my report of 2016, I've said I want something, you know, I've taken the audit word out of it. Yeah. I think that was what was scary. You know, if I were to say, I don't know, if I look at randomly of ANZ Banks there or, or Auckland Council, um, if, if I were to say, I'm going to audit you, you know, that could be root and branch. That could be a hugely costly exercise to demonstrate their full compliance. 
What I've asked for is something that gets the benefit, but more targeted, a right to require an agency to demonstrate an element of compliance. So you say you fix this thing, prove it. Mm. Show me the code that uh, will provide the reassurance that that bug is gone. Demonstrate to me that you've provided the level of training that would ensure a raised level of awareness that avoids the kind of employee browsing issues you've been plagued with, or something like that. So I've asked for a power to um, to do that. And that is, uh, again, a, a really important principle that is consistent with the GDPR. But to come back to your earlier question uh, about, you know, are we just aspiring to this foreign ideal? Actually, no, I'm aspiring to a domestic ideal. You know, what other areas of um, consumer right, you know, your individual entitlements, uh, are almost entirely voluntary in the regulatory system. If your employer asks you to go into a dangerous workspace or asks to pay you in shells or, um, uh, or, 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 or something like that, yeah, well, yeah if, if, if you know, you're blatantly ripped off by um, uh, somebody who misrepresents their obligations under the Consumer Guarantee Act, you know, the Labour Inspectorate can get your employer into court. The Commerce Commission can prosecute those breaches of those important consumer laws. Somehow your data, your personal information, is not important enough to warrant the same level of protection as you're entitled to as, a, as an employee or as a, a consumer of goods and services. And you made reference to wanting you know, this ability to audit but not calling it audit. And, and you're referring, of course, to your Section 26 report um, in 2016. Can you tell us a bit more about some other things that were in that report that haven't been reflected in the current bill? Sure. Uh, well, one of them, of course, is the fine regime that I've just alluded to. You know, we should be on a par with the Commerce Commission or the Labour Inspector. Just use two examples. Um, another was to um, the, the, the audit mechanism. We also have been looking around a lot of government's aspirations that we, as a whole economy, should be able to share from common and public data sets. Now that means putting more anonymized information into the public domain to let people fiddle with it. Uh, to, you know, if government says, we think a fuel tax is gonna do X, well, where's your evidence? You know, show us what the, uh, you know, what is the data that you've collected on that analysis to, to really improve contestability of public advice and, um, and also to allow a wider range of organisations to get the commercial benefit of better data. So there is a real push to improve the availability of public data sets. We've said we support that. You know, it's really important that um, these public assets are available for public consumption. But how do you do that safely? You know, you can say it's anonymised. If you just take out names, if you take out addresses from a, a, a spreadsheet, have you anonymised it? Well, we know that the answer to that is no. So what we've suggested is that there should be uh, some really strong leadership uh, and standard setting in terms of de-identification standards. In that report, we also said maybe we should look at some kind of principle prohibiting re-identification of a de-identified data set. Now, we were quite radical when we made that suggestion mm. back in 2016. But following a breach of... Um, or what they call a re-identification attack of publicly released health statistics in, uh, in Victoria, in Australia. Um, the federal government there, Commonwealth government, has made um, introduced legislation to make re-identification a criminal offence. That's really raising the bar. Yeah. The, the law in the UK, data protection law, uh, includes a provision to prohibit re-identification. So, you know, here is a response, the Privacy Act is enabling, it does enable use of data for research purposes and the like, um, but again we're saying it can uh, facilitate that in ways that set the parameters so that the data is still safe. That was another element. Um, we made suggestions for uh, improving the um, criminal offence of obstructing the Privacy Commission. It's quite hard to prosecute people. And it's really annoying, because I find people in my way everywhere. I go to the airport, go to the air, just like they're struggling the privacy commissioner, hindering the privacy commissioner. Um, uh, but we have had a bit of trouble with that provision. Um, 
I, you know, in terms of aspiration, uh, I guess if I have these other techniques to enforce the law, um, that will become uh, of less significance. Just on that point, how have you found agencies up to now, under the current Act, dealing with your office? For example, you've had voluntary, man uh, voluntary data breach notification for quite some time. Have you seen agencies coming to the party and using those, those frameworks voluntarily? Yes, we have, uh, and I think that's been um, really useful. Uh, what I see now in the discussion, and I think it's really important that we have this publicly, is, is, um, is that that um, value proposition is not universally held. There is some anxiety out there, I think, about agencies having to come to me. The guy who's saying, I want to be able to take you to court and so you, you know, get a million dollar fine for you, you have to come to me and open your pockets about a data breach. I understand that tension. Yeah. What I would say is that um, I don't think people who, who reach out for help or who say, hey, something's gone wrong, are ever going to be the um, subjects of the enhanced enforcement regime. It's the ones that simply show us the hand. Mm. So you said before, um, you know, should every agency in New Zealand be judged by the standard of uh, the kind of agency that's just shunning its responsibilities? And I think no, and they won't. And most agencies will comply if you give them the tools to do so. Yep. I'm actually talking about um, supporting that practice. Because if you're running a business where you invest in uh, good data protection practices, maybe you go and buy a bit of the privacy consultant's expertise to help you um, improve your practices, then you know, you're prioritizing it, you're investing. Another agency that just says, well, there's no consequences, so I don't give a stuff, they can undercut you. And I think that's really un unhelpful uh, and sends a really kind of perverse signal. Yeah. So it is the... Uh, um, these recalcitrant, repetitive agencies, the sorts of ones we've had to name in, our, in, in accordance with our naming policy, yep. that would be the target of any kind of enhanced uh, enforcement regime. And that's one thing worth remembering is that you know, you've had enforcement, some level of enforcement powers or the ability to do certain things like compel an agency to give you evidence on an investigation or to name an organisation publicly if it achieves the purposes of the act. Yeah. And one thing I think a lot of agencies and people in the public have noticed is that you have taken in the last five years, four years, um, a chance to use those powers that were previously relatively unused. Um, did you do that on, on the basis of showing that you were willing to use what you had and that there was a need for more? Uh, yes, I did. I mean, I, I, what we've tried to do is um, really make it easy for agencies to comply with their obligations. I mean, mm -hmm. you look at a range of studies about the, the determinants of legal compliance across tax, across a whole lot of regulatory areas. The single most important is ease. So we're trying to make it easy because we know most agencies, maybe they don't internalize the values of privacy, maybe they don't care that much, but they, well, they want to get it right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, we, we try and help those ones. Uh, the ones that maybe get it wrong um, but um, need to be guided, we will engage with them and, and we'll say, listen, you can do this the easy way or the hard way. And normally they'll go for the easy way. Uh, there is a small proportion who will just show us the finger or the hand or whichever part of the digital apparatus you want to engage. But, you know, we had one, um, for example, um, set up in a mall, um, a suburban mall, and um, they were called Expression Sessions. Just to turn the screw a little bit. Um, this, is, this is your soapbox, go for it. So <laughs> this outfit said, you know, come into a sitting for a family portrait. And this woman came along and um, the deal was, you do the sitting, get the photos, come back and have a look. If you like it, we'll do the prints for you. We'll mount them and frame them and it'll be lovely. Um, and if you don't want it, no obligation, and we'll delete everything, we won't use it for anything else. So this person said, okay, that sounds like a deal. She did the sitting, um, she came back, saw her angelic children, beautiful, this, you know, most beautiful children in the world. Um, and, um, but she said, unfortunately, I can't afford it. So I exercised my right not to, not to proceed. Well, next time she went back to that mall and saw the banners for expression session, Guess whose mother she saw beaming back out at her, her, right? Her own. 
So, you know, an obvious and flagrant breach of privacy principles, as well as just general consumer law. Um, and we tried to, you know, she complained to us, we tried to engage. Why should we? You know, no reply to letters, no level of engagement. So all we could do is warn people to say, this is how this outfit operates, just be conscious of that. Now, I actually think um, we should be able to take an organisation like that and, and um, show them that there are consequences. This is not a voluntary um, bit of regulation. Uh, it is important. Yeah. So your, your comment before about making privacy easy, I think a lot of organisations really welcome that. And a lot of people will be looking at the mandatory breach notification requirements, for example, and thinking, how do we apply these? There's a lot of thresholds and, and standards and definitions in there that we need to be comfortable at understanding, interpreting and applying. Do you see, well firstly, do you think the current drafting of the mandatory breach section of the bill could create problems? And if so, do you see, if, if it's passed as it is, do you see a role in your, for your office to help people get it right? Everything, every, every draft involves um, a, a set of choices, mm -hmm. right? Um, of course, this current drafting could cause some problems. I think it causes fewer problems than previous ideas that we've seen. Um, but again, this is something that I'm not going to um, take ownership of and say, we have recommended this, we think this is the best it can be. Because this is actually an area that I think um, industry needs to look at and say, this works, this doesn't, um, this, uh, you know, here's how you could improve it. And one of the issues about the breach threshold is that it is a speculation about causing harm. Now we've become quite good at assessing harm in privacy. But what we do in our office is we do it ex post. So someone comes to us and says, this breach happened and it harmed me. And we say, oh yeah, what was the harm? And they say, well here's the letter from my doctor, here's the bill from the security company, here's the, you know, so we've got tangible evidence ex post. Actually anticipating harm that might occur in the future is a more complicated matter. Who was the famous baseballer who said um, predictions are really hard, especially about the future? Um, <laughs> so, you know, there are challenges there, uh, and I think that um, to make this law effective uh, requires all of industry and academia and others to, to, to help and to tell Parliament what will work and what won't work. Do you think the changes are going to change? I mean, obviously, with increased powers of enforcement, with increased uh, very strict obligations on agencies that might require more educative work, do you see the face and the composition of your office changing significantly as the new bill comes into force? Uh, yeah, I think it will a bit. I think we probably will have more litigation. Um, now you threw me, you locked me a one of the extra parts in the bill, which I didn't pick up, sorry. So in addition to the um, um, mandatory breach notification, there is going to be an ability for me to serve compliance notices on agencies. So I will find some agency doing something that is not complying with their obligations under the Privacy Act, and I'll be able to go to them and say, hey, you're not complying with your obligations under the Privacy Act, Here's a notice which says you must comply with your obligations under the Privacy Act, and then they will have to um, um, comply with your obligations under the Privacy Act. Let's hope. <laughs> now that'll be legally enforceable somehow uh, through the Human Rights Review Tribunal. The other thing is um, uh, uh, access determinations. So we will be able to um, uh, hopefully uh, fast track getting people the information to which they're entitled. Uh, so rather than getting to the end of our investigation and saying, well, sorry, we tried, that's all we can do, go off to the Human Rights Review Tribunal, what like, you know, poor vulnerable um, Mr. Dotcom had to do um, with his access request recently. He worked his way through the tribunal, got orders against agencies to um, enforce his rights, and an award of $90,000 into the bargain. But, you know, that took quite a lot of effort on his part and part of his legal team, um, and that's quite a burden. Yeah. We'll be able to, I think, shortcut that by uh, serving notices. Sorry, it's a very long-winded answer to your to thing, requiring obligation. That's going to switch the litigation burden onto the agency. So rather than you as an individual having to prosecute this matter over two or three years, uh, the notice will be binding, and if uh, the agency wants to contest it, if they say, 
Privacy Commission has got it wrong, we shouldn't have to do this. Uh, they have to go into the Human Rights Review Tribunal to overturn it. So the winding back to your question, will I need to change the office? I can't remember what my question was. The question was, will, will these new powers change the way our office works? I think we'll uh, have more litigation. Uh, I also think we'll probably need to have a, a sharper distinction between the dispute resolution functions, which we are now, uh, you know, we do really well at the moment, mm. and the enforcement functions. I think my staff who do investigations and dispute resolution, uh, I think national leaders in terms of alternative dispute practice. Um, but you can't ask someone to come to the table and make concessions and engage in a process of reconciliation with the promise that um, if you don't do it, we're going to take all this information go around the back and use it to um, beat you in the tribunal or in the court. So we probably need to have some thought about how we divide up those functions and um, uh, and clearly differentiate you know, between the hats that we're wearing. Are we investigating, are we trying to resolve, or are we enforcing or prosecuting? Do you think you'll need to hire different types of individuals to fulfil some of your new functions? Will there be a, a different a different layout, I suppose, in terms of the way that you operate internally? Well, one of one of the elements of the um, bill that hasn't had much uh, um, publicity, I think, is the um, requirement to take into account different cultural perspectives. Now, I would love to see um, the diversity of my office improve, uh, and I'd love to see. Uh, more Maori, Pacifica, uh, Asian communities represented on my staff so that we as a, as a government organisation can reflect better the communities that we're there to serve. So that may be a change yeah, in yeah. the organisation. So just quickly on a completely changing tack because I know that we're running into time for questions from the audience. GDPR, how much do you think agencies in New Zealand need to care about it? Uh, well, it depends. I think the ones who really do need to care about it probably know that already, and um, they probably have an office in Europe. They probably have, um, you know, targeting Europeans uh, as part of their business. So, you know, they've looked at it, they're aware of it. If you're wondering, um, you know, I think it was you who uh, threw me the lovely line that um, going out and talking to agencies that are concerned about GDPR, you often lift up the hood and find that um, actually their compliance with the Privacy Act could use a bit of a tweak. Uh, so I, I think that would be a really good start. You know, if you're worried about GDPR, just make sure that you're complying with the New Zealand Privacy Act first. And you're probably, you know, 85%, 90%, for most kind of commercial entities selling the other thing into Europe, 99% of the way there. Yeah. Um, there's very little automated processing. Um, most New Zealand agencies would honour a request to be forgotten by a customer who says, I don't want to hear another word from all birds. Um, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, uh, yeah, I think don't panic is, my, is yeah. my principal message. And the other thing is, there are a lot of areas of uncertainty with the new regulation. That will settle uh, as we start to see my counterparts in Europe make decisions, and I'll try and capture those and communicate them out to the New Zealand community as well. That's a good segue to my next question, which is: What do you, what, what role you anticipate your office playing in the enforcement of breaches of GDPR? I'm aware you've got a global enforcement network at the moment that effectively shares that enforcement and compliance burden. Do you see a role for yourself? Yeah, well, I think that um, enforcement cooperation is increasingly a preoccupation of my colleagues internationally, and it reflects the borderless nature of the digital economy. Yeah. Um, so we need to help uh, New Zealand citizens who experience problems in other jurisdictions to, to get to an, an account part that can deliver remedies. We need to ensure that um, Europeans who experience problems as a result of uh, breaches by New Zealand entities have uh, adequate remedies as well. So um, it'll be business as usual. I mean, I mean, I don't see you know setting up a new GDPR business unit or anything like that. But uh, we'll continue to um, uh, cooperate with our international colleagues. And do you think the fact that more agencies in New Zealand might be caught by European law could increase the demand in your office from European? supervisory authorities? It, it wouldn't be a short or even medium term uh, concern for me, I think. Um, yeah. But, um, I, you know, I may be proved wrong on that and we may have to pivot and 
and ramp up our, our, our international um, engagement. Okay. And I, I, perhaps the last question for me before we open to the floor is kind of tying the Privacy Bill and GDPR together. If the Privacy Bill was to be passed today, as it looks today, do you think our EU adequacy status is at risk? Uh, it's not at risk today, and it's probably not at risk when the Privacy Bill passes um, in April next year. I would be concerned, though, um, you know, it's not something we can take for granted. We have been told that uh, our adequacy will be maintained into the new era. Sorry, we're talking as if everybody knows what we're talking about. In 1995, the European Data Protection Directive, for shorthand, um, said that if you in Europe, you cannot allow the transmission of personal information to a non-European country unless that non-European country has an adequate level of data protection. New Zealand achieved adequacy status in 2012, uh, Darwin said, will that continue? Well, as they went through the process of developing this new regulation, they thought about scrapping all adequacy and making countries reapply. They ditched that, thankfully. They thought about a sunset clause. Let's transition people for three years and then drop it. But they ditched that as well. What we have now is an undertaking that our adequacy will be recognised for the foreseeable future. But I have an obligation to report on a six monthly basis to the European Commission on developments in privacy that might affect uh, the privacy of Europeans. So I will be reporting, you know, I, I reported on the Harmful Digital Communications Act, for example. I reported on the um, Intelligence and Security Act. Uh, and I will next year, I guess, have to report on the developments in the Privacy Act. Uh, and we may get questions from Europe about, well, hang on, why don't you have this right to be forgotten? Or why don't you have the right to object to automated processing? Uh, we'll deal with those as they come up.